Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, the newest survivor coming to the game this mid-chapter. The Tomb Raider herself, Lara Croft. Okay, before this video gets going, I need to set the truth 100% out there. Tomb Raider has been a favourite game series of mine since I was about 6 or 7 years old. So I'm very, very biased in favour of Lara and her inclusion in Dead by Daylight. As you might expect in that case, I reacted to the news of the upcoming Tomb Raider release with nothing but dignity, grace, and a calm that was, frankly, borderline zen. Part of me wants to just go off to you about Tomb Raider right now and how its adaptation to Dead by Daylight was handled, whether Lara Croft belongs in the game, etc. But at least for now, I'm going to hold myself back just a little bit. At the end of the day, I'm not sure how popular Tomb Raider is in the 2020s, especially among the younger gamers who make up a lot of my audience. So let's start off with the Cliffs Notes, no pun intended, of what Tomb Raider is and a brief history of the series' leading lady, Lara Croft. Tomb Raider is a third-person action-adventure series that started with, well, Tomb Raider in 1996, and follows the adventures of one Lara Croft, an explorer and archaeologist dedicated to finding the secrets of the ancient world. When the first game released in 96, it became an instant classic, a genuinely revolutionary game that maybe we don't really appreciate enough today. 1996 in general was a huge year for gaming, while Super Mario 64 went on to defy the 3D platformer and Resident Evil birthed the survival horror subgenre, Tomb Raider was setting the standard for 3D action-adventure games for years after its release. Everything from the 3D tank controls, to the more realistic environments, to Lara herself, a strong and smart female protagonist who was a real novelty in 1996 and who contributed to the game's massive sales to the point that the success of the original PlayStation was credited in large part to Tomb Raider being one of the first third-party games to debut on the system. And Tomb Raider's popularity was sustained throughout a string of releases from the 90s and well into the 2000s, with Lara Croft even being one of the first video game characters to ever be adapted successfully into a live-action film. Who could forget Angelina Jolie in 2001's Lara Croft Tomb Raider? Please, this question isn't rhetorical. If you are somebody who has forgotten that film, please tell me how you did it. I'm very, very jealous. But you might have noticed something. This doesn't look like this, or this, or anything like this. And that's because the Lara Croft that we have in Dead by Daylight looks like this. Because starting in 2013, a new continuity was established. Something that came to be known as the Survivor Trilogy. Covering the early days of Lara Croft as she was starting out to become the Tomb Raider that we all know and love. The Lara of 2013's Tomb Raider is very different from the seasoned adventurer that we knew from the earlier games. She's just 21 years old, and despite being trained in bushcraft, marksmanship, and gymnastics, she hasn't seen actual combat before. She starts out as just an academic and archaeologist trying to prove herself, but the events of the game serve to harden her into a survivor deserving of the title. The transformation from the scared and desperate Lara Croft into the confident badass Tomb Raider is continued in the following two games. Rise of the Tomb Raider, which explores the legacy Lara's father left behind and her attempts to vindicate the theories that got him rejected by the scientific community, and Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which shows Lara finally growing into the role she was always meant for, and come to terms with the consequences of the life she's leading. It's this continuity of Lara that Dead by Daylight is adapting, and her DVD story picks her up at about the middle point of the 2013 game, before the end of that game and the events of Rise and Shadow. Dead by Daylight's lore for Lara starts at the very beginning of her story, opening with her childhood and the loving relationship she had with her father, the late Lord Richard Croft. Richard was an archaeologist who burned away his family's money and prestige chasing myths and legends in the far corners of the world, and when he died, Lara took up that goal for herself. This took her and several of her father's former colleagues into the Dragon's Triangle south of Japan to look for the island of Yamatai, and they found it by being shipwrecked on it. Wounded, alone, and terrified, Lara pushes through indomitable odds to not only survive in the wilderness, but save a few of her friends along the way, and learn more about the circumstances behind the shipwreck. Her expedition team weren't the first people to get stuck on Yamatai. The island is populated by a huge number of castaways that formed a cult known as the Solari, and its leader Matthias is certain that he's found a way for them all to escape back to the mainland. Interred in a tomb on the island is the Sun Queen Himiko the former ruler of Yamatai, and Matthias believes that by appeasing her vengeful spirit, the Solari will be able to leave the island. Sam, Lara's best friend on the expedition, is kidnapped by the Solari with the intention of being used as the new vessel for Himiko's spirit, 
and Lara is uh, not best pleased about that, to put it kindly. But she's captured by the Solari in her attempt to save Sam, and this is when things get a little bit entity-y. Just like she does in the game proper, Lara gives her captors the slip and escapes into a river of blood underneath the bridge. But this time around, she has a little bit of help. A mysterious black fog provides the distraction she needed to allow Lara to escape, but it isn't done with her yet. As she sinks into the blood and viscera below, the entity turns its attention to her. She's pulled down into the gore and the mire, struggling as a dozen arms pulling her down into the muck, and thus the entity claimed Lara Croft for its own. Normally, after reading the lore, I'd go into the quality of the adaptation between the Tomb Raider games and Dead by Daylight, but there's something I want to discuss first that's caught my interest in the past week or two. When the idea of Lara Croft being the mysterious summer survivor started to gain traction, I noticed two main points of contention. Some folks were saying that Tomb Raider didn't belong in Dead by Daylight at all, due to the game not exactly being a horror series. And there were many long-time Tomb Raider fans asserting that if we were to get Lara in the game, we should get the classic version from the core design era of the series, as opposed to the modern Lara from the 2013 reboot onwards. And while the first critique is to me the more interesting of the two to address, I want to talk briefly about the choice to adapt specifically the 2013 version of Lara in Dead by Daylight over the classic version, and the point in the game from which adaptation is taken. If you don't want to hear me talk about this stuff, use the timestamp to skip ahead to me talking about the perks and other parts of the DLC itself, because I have plenty to say about those, but I have just much to say about the question of Lara belonging in DVD at all, so why not talk about it? Tomb Raider 2013 is in every way Lara Croft at her most vulnerable. She's inexperienced, poorly equipped, and has to deal with the emotional fallout of taking your life for the first time. While she may not have the confidence and experience she'll have later, she displays incredible strength and perseverance with how she adapts to her adversity, and it's that combination of vulnerability and tenacity that characterises Lara in this game. If we were looking to adapt Lara into a game like Fortnite, where being brash and bold and badass was something that could easily translate into gameplay, then a classic iteration of Lara would have been a reasonable choice. Maybe the unified Lara that we've been catching glimpses of since Shadow, which has been the rights holders trying to write the events of the earlier Tomb Raider games into the same canon as Survivor Lara. But Dead by Daylight isn't that kind of game. The Survivor world is all about towing that line between strength and vulnerability. The duality of being out of your depth pursued by a monstrous killer, but at the same time being strong enough to endure through and live another day. 2013's Tomb Raider adaptation balances along that line like a fallen log, so picking its version of Lara, who hasn't been able to fully overcome her dangers yet, is perfect. Something is particularly clear if you've played the game before reading the lore. When you get to this point in the game, the iconic River of Blood moment, Lara is effectively at her lowest point. She failed to save Sam from the Solari, her other friends are missing, injured or killed, and she's stripped of her weapons and gear, seemingly helpless to prevent Matthias' plans. Her escape from their grasp into the pool of blood isn't treated as some cathartic moment where she regains her second wind, but is framed more like a descent into hell itself, with the level to follow exploring the Solari's prism and proving grounds where Lara is faced with the depth of Matthias' cruelty. It's the darkest part in an already dark game. There's no better opportunity for the entity to step in and take Lara from the metaphorical representation of hell on Yamatai into a rather more literal interpretation. The choice to take Lara from the middle point of the first game in the reboot run also serves as a useful purpose to Dead by Daylight players who don't have any prior experience with the series, because 2013's Tomb Raider game is right at the start of Lara's story, and that means the events that conclude that game, the the events of Rise and Shadow, don't get spoiled for anybody who hasn't played them yet. By the way, if you were looking to get into the Tomb Raider series, now would be a really good time to do so. You can get Steam keys for each game in the reboot run for about £5 a pop right now if you know where to look, and unlike a lot of classic game series, the older games are still very accessible without needing to say all the seven Cs. Oh, and um, a time of writing, most of the series is also in the Steam Summer Sale, so you can get them incredibly cheap. Getting 2013's Tomb Raider for 95% off is the best 62p you'll ever spend, trust me. Yeah, but there's a fine of a thousand rupees, that's about 13 quid. 13 pounds, I mean, I ain't got that sort of money. I'm not paying 13 quid. No, no, no. While all the games have their merits, yes, even Chronicles, and everyone's got their own favourite version of Lara, I think it's hard to argue that there's a version of Lara that's more suitable as a survivor than, well, survivor Lara. And taking her from a portion of the 2013 game where she's been disarmed already and is trudging through the blood-soaked hell underneath the Solari stronghold is probably the best place to take her from. But that still leaves a relevant question. 
Why should Dead by Daylight have Lara Croft at all? DBD has always been called a horror hall of fame, or the Smash Bros of horror, and Tomb Raider is not exactly a horror game. So a lot of folks have expressed discontent at Lara being included. She's not part of the horror club, and my feelings on this are a little complicated. First things first, I don't believe Dead by Daylight needs to exist solely as a celebration of other people's properties. The game has very much become its own thing, with its own tone and its own identity. Licensed chapters might get most of the attention, most of the sales, and this year at least, most of the release slots. But Dead by Daylight's originals have always been fundamental to the game's tone, and that's allowed behaviour to expand beyond the bare-bones archetypes of slasher horror. We've had half a dozen or more killers now, who almost entirely disregard the conventions of modern horror stories, to instead tell stories set in historical contexts. We've had a Wild West killer, a feudal Japanese samurai killer, a Babylonian priestess killer, and a pair of pre-revolutionary French peasant killers. And none of these really fit into traditional horror archetypes and conventions. Instead, they take the stories and styles of the time periods and apply a heavy coating of Dead by Daylight's bleak horror tone. They're not horror stories that Dead by Daylight has picked up to tell, they're made into horror stories of being part of Dead by Daylight. And Tomb Raider, I believe, is an example of this applied to a licensed crossover. Just like the stories of the historical domain killers, 2013's Tomb Raider isn't explicitly a horror story, but the tone is adjacent enough to DVDs that seeing Lara in the fog doesn't break your immersion. We can quibble about genre all we want, but if your immersion and the game's diegesis isn't spoiled by the presence of your character in the games and in the lore, then what's really the issue with including them? The newest full chapter, Dungeons and Dragons, is the perfect proof of how maintaining immersion is the single most important part of adapting a non-horror license into Dead by Daylight. Dungeons and Dragons is much further from horror than Tomb Raider. A shipwrecked archaeologist on an island full of murderous cultists is closer to a conventional horror story than elves pulling loots out of their asses. But the chapter very carefully toes the line between keeping D&D recognisable and not breaking the immersion with Dead by Daylight's grisly serious tone. And with the possible exception of some parts of the bards, I'd say it broadly succeeds. On the flip side, there's plenty of actual conventional horror out there that would not be a tonal fit for Dead by Daylight that would break your immersion even though it's remaining technically within genre. Great example here is Killer Clowns from Outer Space. That's horror, yes, but it's also so absurdly goofy and campy that a clown's chapter would be an immediate point of ridicule and utterly break immersion. American Psycho is an example on the other end of the camp spectrum. Patrick Bateman is the definition of just a guy, and the whole point of American Psycho is to critique the corporate yuppie culture of 80s America. Trying to divorce American Psycho from you know, America, to adapt Bateman into DBD as a killer just because it's horror would be like trying to put a live cow between two slices of bread and taking a bite just because you know burgers are made from beef. 2013's Tomb Raider isn't a fit in genre, but it is a fit in tone. And in my opinion, that's what really matters when deciding whether or not a license belongs in this game. And it gets even harder to dispute when you realise that the Tomb Raider release isn't even a full chapter. While our killers have to be fearsome and gritty enough to preserve DBD's horror tone, the survivors are not so heavily restricted and never have been. Most of our survivors are just people from ordinary walks of life, and work as survivors not because they were characters in a horror story before they were taken, but because they have the temperament for it, a skill set or mindset that would make them an interesting character to explore in a horror setting. If we're going to take issue with Lara because she's not explicitly a horror character, then I invite you to tell me where the horror story is in being an office desk jockey, or a celebrity musician, or Oprah Winfrey, or a big gay rugby player. Never mind, actually, David's from Manchester, that's all the horror you need. I guarantee you, if the Tomb Raider franchise never existed, and Lara was written and presented exactly the same way that she is now, but was an original survivor instead of a license, nobody would ever say that she felt out of place in the roster. And I can prove that, because for the last three and a half years, she basically has been. Elodie Rokoto has been Dead by Daylight's original answer to Lara Croft for years now. Elodie was born to rich parents and inherited their fortune after it disappeared due to the involvement of a shadowy secret organisation. This group is trying to use forbidden mystical forces to gain great power which they will inevitably misuse, and Elodie often runs into them throughout the course of her adventures. She travels the world collecting artefacts from ancient civilizations and groups to better understand these mystical forces to prevent the group from achieving their goals and to fulfill the legacy of the parents that she still misses. I asked the Tomb Raider fans watching this video, does any of this sound familiar to you? Because it should. We've had Lara Croft in DVD for years, we just haven't noticed before. And if that's not a shining endorsement of the genuine article's inclusion into the fog, 
I don't know what is. Of course, all of this is dependent entirely on the success of the adaptation itself. It's very well if Tomb Raider fits into the DVD smoothly in theory, but if the implementation is lackluster in practice, then what's the point of the whole endeavour? We've had a hot streak of incredible solo licensed survivors lately. Year 8 brought us Nick Cage and Alan Wake, who were brought to life in spectacular fashion. And I'm pleased to say Lara Croft is mostly handled with the same level of love and faithfulness to the source material. The first place to look here is in the perks. Specialist allows you to convert time spent searching chests into permanent progress and generators. Finesse lets you vault pallets and windows faster than ever if you can hit a fast vault. And Harden turns your screams into aura reading on the killer once you complete the perk's little side quest. And let me be clear here, none of these perks are particularly, um, you know, sexy. There's no weird props or new perk types here and the effects aren't going to shake up the meta. Well, Finesse might. But that doesn't mean that they don't work as solid adaptations of Lara's character traits. Hardened is without a doubt my favourite for this, because it encourages you to do what Tomb Raider is all about. Exploring, looting, taking out traps, and once you've done all of that, your resolve steals and you're ready to take on whatever the fog has to throw at you. What used to scare you instead just makes you stronger, and more able to face your fears. It's a simplified distillation of Lara's entire character arc throughout the 2013 game, and to a lesser degree the sequels in the Survivor Trilogy. It's elegant, it's simple, and it's unfortunately a bit shit. I'd like to see it buffed personally between PTB and live. Given how much you have to do to get it, I think maybe it should trigger whenever anyone screams, or it should suppress missed skill check noises on generators and reveal the killer's aura off of those as well. It's not strong, but it doesn't mean it is not a solid top-down design. Finesse is the perk everyone's talking about. Survivor YouTubers are dancing in the streets because their husband the vault build has finally returned from the spine chill war. But not only is finesse definitely the best perk in this release, it's also a pretty big flavour win as well. Both in the original games and the reboot series, Lara has been a gifted athlete and acrobat. Capable of climbing sheer rock faces and pulling off death defying leaps. I guarantee you if Bounce Landing or Life didn't exist, Lara would have had some variant of those as a perk. But finesse is the next best thing. With the unique animation of the survivor clearing the vault with both feet like an Olympic long jumper, really selling the idea. There's a reason the animation looks really good on Lara, but pretty crap on almost anyone else. And the third perk is Specialist, which in terms of gameplay is hands down my favourite from this release. Being able to turn time theoretically wasted opening chests into permanent progress on critical generators is awesome, and it brings to mind the salvage system that persisted throughout the Survivor trilogy of games. Salvage is a resource for constantly accumulating from crates and supplies in the world, and you use it for everything from upgrading your weapons to crafting shrapnel grenades in the heat of combat. Using components from resource drops found in the world to permanently improve your gear is called Tomb Raider, and it's a feature expanded on in Rise and Shadow with the much bigger and more detailed crafting systems. While I wish it had some slightly more radical effects, imagine if you could break a pallet or breakable wall to salvage it to charge up this perk, it's definitely recognisable enough for fans of the games as an idea of a mainstay Tomb Raider mechanic reworked to fit a completely different game. Oh, one little thing about Specialist by the way, Lara won't release until after the anniversary event is over, but players will still have tons and tons of the anniversary offerings, the Screech Cobblers, in their inventories. I don't know if you've noticed, but the Screech Cobblers give an extra chest for each one that's used in a trial. This means that Specialist is going to be so much more usable than it will be any other time in the year. Five cobblers means eight chests in one match. As long as you can unlock specialists on a survivor who has cobblers on them, i.e. not Lara, you're going to get so much perk value if you play during the few weeks after Lara comes out. I don't know if Behaviour realised this when they added the chest clause to cobblers, but if they did, they were fucking geniuses. And if they didn't, I'm a fucking genius thinking of it, so either way I'm feeling pretty good right now. Obviously Lara is much more than just her perks though. Her model is one of the best licensed survivor models you've ever had recapturing her look from the first game in incredible detail, to the point that on one occasion playing on the PTB, I wanted to find a chest to use specialist, so I pressed Q. In the Tomb Raider reboot run, that's the button for survival instincts that will highlight the auras of nearby items and collectibles. I'm so used to seeing Lara in the middle of my screen looking like this, that my brain momentarily thought it was playing a different game. That's how good she looks. Her model in DVD is taken from her look in the 2013 game, and it genuinely looks better than the same outfit that you can equip in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Seriously though, how do they mess her face up so badly in this one? Her face is gorgeous in every other installment in every other outfit, 
but in this specific game, in this specific outfit, it looks like she's been put through that horrible makeup filter that the higher fans guys used. Kind of flies against the image of this rugged survivor. A touch that I really like is the red stain on her left hip. At the very start of the first game, she falls and impales herself on a chunk of rebar, an injury that debilitates her throughout much of the first game and that she still clutches sometimes in the second game. They didn't need to do it, but they did, and it is a nice touch. What really stood out to me when I was playing the PTB was Lara's voice lines. She has a ton of them. If we're very used to one particular voice actress playing Lara, it might seem a little bit off. If someone told me two weeks ago that Lara Croft, based on the 2013 adaptation, was coming to DVD with full voice lines, first of all I'd do a little dance, and then I'd immediately assume that the voice work would be done by Camilla Luddington, the voice actress who played Lara and motion cap for her in all three of the Survivor games. Looks like this was abandoned in a hurry. The Soviets find something down there. Her voice is impossible to disassociate from Croft. And while she's obviously not the only voice actress to ever voice Lara over the years, she's definitely the most recognisable for newcomers. And yet, unless I am very much mistaken, Lara in DVD isn't voiced by Luddington. Her voice is a bit lower, a little bit older, and definitely a bit more upper class. You might sometimes forget that Lara is a member of the aristocracy when she's not wandering around Croft Manor during the games, but there's no making that mistake here. That was bloody close! We don't know for sure that it isn't Luddington, or who it might actually be, but my money's on a bigger name than DBD is normally used to. Hayley Atwell, who you might know from being Peggy Carter in the MCU. Just listen to the voices. I can't. Something very exciting has just happened. If it isn't Atwell, it's someone doing a close impression. Similar to how Pinhead on the PTB was originally voiced by someone doing an impression of Doug Bradley until we got actual Doug Bradley a little bit later. And I'm not just guessing about Atwell, well, I am, but it's an educated guess, because Hayley Atwell is, as far as we know, the new voice of Lara Croft. October the 10th this year, Netflix will be releasing the animated show Tomb Raider The Legend of Lara Croft, which will explicitly be set in the Survivor timeline as a follow-up to Shadow of the Tomb Raider and a formal introduction of Unified Lara. And our new voice actress for Lara is, surprise surprise, Hayley Atwell. So if it is Atwell, while we probably don't have the historic Lara voice that we know, we still have an authentic Lara voice in DVD, and want the will only age better when The Legend of Lara Croft hits in October, and potentially more Tomb Raider media to follow if Atwell stays on to voice act for her. But be that as it may, with the voice of maybe Atwell, lies my only real issue with the Tomb Raider adaptation to Dead by Daylight. I like the new voice. It's not Camilla, but it's great anyway. And if Camilla's finished with Lara for good, we can't expect her to come back for the voice of a DVD five years after retiring the character. No, my issue with the voice lines isn't the voice, it's the lines. Because despite Lara being a very well-defined and talkative character in her games, her lines in DVD aren't very, you know, characterful. They're short, generic, the kind of things that anyone would say. Well, anyone so English they bleed tea anyway. I wish the lines she said were more evocative of Lara's spirit of exploration and discovery. The kind of things that an archaeologist who braves the terrors of the world and the interests of knowledge would say. And the relic mechanic in the reboot series is the perfect showcase of what I mean here. Every so often, Lara might find a relic scattered amongst the ruins, and when you find it, she'll give you a nice little historical profile about it. When and where it was made, who might have used it, what's been done to it over the years and why. This Chinese earthenware is thousands of years old. Could they have visited this island before the rise of Yamatai? It was immersive and charming, reminding us that Lara's not just a badass, but an academic and a scholar, an enthusiast and student of history. Imagine if DBD did something similar. Uh, Lara maybe loads into a map or encounters a killer from a real historical period. She might say something about that. Not some big lecture, just a little comment to remind us that we're playing Lara Croft, adventure archaeologist. I don't believe for one second that Lara would find herself in an ancient Babylonian temple, get attacked by a 13th century Hungarian knight, or even square off with an Oni who very closely resembles one of the Stormguard of Yamatai, and just not find that interesting enough to comment upon. I took issue with Wesker's voice lines for just being repetitions of lines he had in RE5 that lost all their meaning when they were ripped out of their context, but Lara is, in my opinion, too far the other way. She needs a bit more of the spirit of the games in her voice work because without it, she doesn't really sound like Lara Croft. Something that makes the absence of the instantly recognisable voice of Camille Luddington even more noticeable. But before I tie things up, 
I want to share with you guys a little tinfoil hat conspiracy theory I've been developing as I write this script. Because when it comes to the Tomb Raider release, three things seem off to me. Lara's voice lines seem weirdly restricted and generic. We don't know the voice actress who recorded them. And the typical animated trailer with voiceover that we get for new licensed survivors is nowhere to be seen. At least not yet. All of these things together suggest to me that Lara's voice work might not actually be done yet. And we might have another Pinhead situation on our hands. Those who weren't around back then, when Pinhead released, he had voice lines on the PTB. But they were placeholder lines done by an anonymous voice actor. Because we weren't going to get Doug Bradley for another few months. I think Tomb Raider might be in a similar position. Whoever's voicing Lara might just be doing placeholder lines for now. Because the voice work isn't actually done yet. This might mean that Lara gets a new voice between PTB and live release, or just gets more lines. But it would explain why we don't have a confirmed identity for the voice actor yet, and why no trailer has been released. They'd need the new voice actress to voice the release trailer. Just because the voice actress on the PTB definitely isn't Camille Ludington, doesn't mean we might not get her by the live release. Or if this is Hayley Atwell, we might still get more voice lines anyway, since the lack of a trailer suggests that her voice work might not be fully done yet. Maybe I'm on copium, maybe I'm onto something. But given what happened with Pinhead, I just wanted to share the theory in advance of her release. So that's what I have to say about the Tomb Raider release of Dead by Daylight, the lore of the release, and how well Lara as a character was adapted into our game. It's generally fantastic, a 9.9 .9 out of 10, and another banger in our run of solo licensed characters. And if that's all you came here to see, then you can switch off now. I've said my piece. But if you want to stick around to the end, it's time for me to get a little bit personal, because Tomb Raider and Lara Croft have been very special parts of my life, and regardless of the quality of the adaptation, Lara Croft is my favourite survivor of all time, and if you'll hear me out, I'd like to tell you why. When I was maybe 6 or 7 years old, I played Tomb Raider 3 on my friend's PlayStation 2. That kid Tom, who was my first and best friend when we were that age, so sometimes over the weekend or in the holidays, I'd visit his family at the travellers camp they lived on and play with him. We'd sit in his dad's caravan, eat whatever we'd left in the fridge, and play some proper classics. Time Splitters 2, Pandemonium, Medieval, and a little game called Tomb Raider 3. And I played a lot of games back then, tons of classics on my dad's old Nintendo 64, but there wasn't a game among them that left an impression so profound as Tomb Raider 3, or a protagonist that stuck with me as much as Lara Croft. A lot of the reason why is the formula of the Tomb Raider games themselves. They were puzzle games and adventures first and foremost. You didn't have missions or levels, they were expeditions. You weren't wandering through fantasy forests or alien worlds, but our world, or at least the fictional approximation of it, with puzzles and mysteries around every corner. For an indoorsy and bookish kid, this was a kind of escapism that I loved. Lara wasn't a soldier or a knight, but an explorer and an archaeologist, someone who valued knowledge and finding the truth no matter the perils. As a nerdy fat kid who was playing chess for the county chess team by the age of nine, solving problems and puzzles to explore and learn about the world was everything I wanted. And it helped you get on board with their adventures. When you found a puzzle that was too hard for your six-year-old monkey brain, you felt that puzzlement that Lara would feel in your position. And when you finally cracked it, you felt that little buzz of satisfaction knowing that you and Lara could keep exploring. I know it's a very simple level of gameplay immersion, the kind of thing that we take for granted in games today, but when you're six years old and the gameplay you're getting used to is, um, well, this. <laughs> Tomb Raider was nothing short of captivating. Of course, these times don't last forever. We grow up, friends grow apart. But here comes the reboot in 2013, a new grown-up angsty Tomb Raider to match the new grown-up angsty teenage me. I'd gotten into horror movies by this point, but never seen anything like this in my Tomb Raider games before. All the technical trappings are a modern AAA title, photorealistic environments, enemies and SFX that created the bloody and brutal island of Yamatai, and an equally bloody and brutal new take on Lara Croft. The old Tomb Raider games were a treat for my child mind, but the new titles that allowed Lara and Tomb Raider to age with me. As my tastes in storytelling and character writing matured, the tone of the games and their attitudes towards Lara did too. It felt both like something new and fresh and unmistakably familiar, as if I'd come home after a long, long time away. 
and none of this would have come together the way it did without our leading lady, Lara Croft. When I was young, Lara was my guide through the wonders of the world, the vehicle through which a fairly sheltered kid could explore hidden catacombs, fight wild animals, or solve ancient puzzles. And when I was older, Lara became a character I loved to watch grow throughout the Survivor trilogy. The David fighting the Goliaths of secret conspiracies and ancient powers, who often went in way over her head, but gave as good as she got, and overcame the odds until she realised that she was a little bit too used to the taste of blood in her mouth. To be honest, I think part of me even clicked with how detached Lara's stories were from any suggestions of sex or romance. Far from her reputation as a sex symbol, I always admired how distant Lara herself was from anything like that. It just wasn't a part of her character arcs at any point. In almost 30 years of game, she's never had anything like a love interest or even a one night stand on her adventures. And as someone who'd never taken too much stock in that sort of thing, I saw a little bit of myself in her. Why bother getting yourself entangled like that? When you've got things to do, puzzles to solve, and secrets to unravel. Am I trying to say that I saw Lara as a bit of an ace icon growing up? Yes, it's almost certainly projection, but I don't care. If we aren't going to get representation that's better than barely functional emotionless robots, if not outright sadists, then goddamn I'll come up with my own. A functional, competent, intelligent, and emotionally mature adult who kicks several different grades of ass who is conspicuously missing something that I'd long been told was a foundational part of being an adult. Hopefully you can see why, as a young ace guy, a character like that would stick with me so well. To see this character who was so important to me for so long immortalising the game I've turned into my job has been spectacular. It's given me a level of enthusiasm I don't think I've had for a DVD licence before, maybe only comparable with Pinhead. My friends, by the way, I feel really bad for them because they have to deal with me during this time. I've been a complete hot mess. She's going to be my new main survivor and my next P100 because, well, Lara Croft is an institution of my time growing up playing games. Without Tomb Raider introducing me to gaming as a tool of social bonding, I might not be here talking to you right now about it. So, yeah. Lara's all good in my book. Remember that kid, Tom? The guy I played Tomb Raider 3 with back on his dad's old PlayStation? Well, at this point, what I would want to do is bring him on, talk about the game we used to play together, maybe even get him for the whole video. We could reminisce, reconnect about the game that brought us together and that kind of got me started in playing games with friends. God, I do wish that was still possible. But unfortunately, I can't because he died about six years ago. It'll take a couple of weeks from the release of this video. See that statue back there? The Sir Redvers Buller statue? Uh, yeah, he, uh, he climbed that. It was a bit of a joke, fell off. Smash his head open on the floor. Was unconscious and then died a day later in hospital. Um, it told me that he fell unconscious as soon as he hit the floor. Um, he was celebrating his exams that night, died the night after, but but his last thoughts at least, I was told they were happy. And that's, I guess, all any of us could ask for. Tomb Raider is more to me than any series of games could ever be, and Lara Croft is so much more than just another character. If I could go back in time and tell Tom that we made it happen, that I made a channel, that my my job now is talking about the games I love, the games that I might never have played without him, and that Lara Croft, the character that we bonded over as kids, is now a part of that game, the game that I've made my job, that I've made my life, he'd be grinning from ear to ear. God, I really wish I could see that. Well, it's a bit of a downer ending to this video, but I couldn't think of a better one, so... Rest in peace, mate. And everybody else, I'll, uh, I'll see you in the next one.